to the channel. High time we did some more full crew videos. It has been a big struggle. Workload has got humongous. Um, oh, as you know, if you watch the vlogs, you'll also know that a bit of a brain drain, loads of office work to do, and that just sort of gets in the way of everything on top of all the workload. So I'm gonna try and show you guys a short video, real back to basics with Harris Hawks, Red Tail. No matter what bird you're flying, this part of it is likely to factor into the very basic start of training your full curry bird. For those that know all these things, of course, yes, it's very basic. But a lot of people really do miss out on simple, basic stuff. So let's cover that for the safety of the birds, the, the sanity of the falconer, and of course, the very fact of doing things properly, because there is usually a proper way and a right way of doing things, and that's born out of health and safety for you, safety for the bird, bird welfare, or something that just runs smoothly. So let's get into this video right now. So we're gonna cover in this video, creance training your bird. Those first baby steps of getting that bird to fly to you. We're not gonna talk about how to get the bird to fly to you and weight and motivation, just actually using a creance line properly. So the creance line, a safety line, a line of mistrust. That training line is there to allow you to mentally, for you and the bird, achieve something some sort of regularity, some sort of trust that the bird, when you call it, is going to come back to you before flying it free. And there's a really good reason for that. If you fly the bird free before it's ready and something spooks that bird, it might take stand in a tree nearby, it might take two hours but eventually come back, or it might bolt. And if the bird bolts, it very often in a completely strange area will just lose its head and very, very difficult to reclaim that bird. It'll literally lose its head and all the training you've given can end up going mentally wild, captive bred or not, a mentally wild state where it just won't react to the very basics of training that you've sort of got through so far. So the clearance slide is employed to get that bird to a kind of a place where you think, yeah, if she bolts when she's free now or she goes up a tree, I know I'm gonna get, I'm, she's gonna come back or he's gonna come back even if I've had a little bit of a weight on my hands. Really important, just as importantly, is to A, use the clearance line properly and safely for the bird, and B, stop using the clearance line when you don't need it anymore. So really, really quickly, this is how I train most of my birds, calling them to the glove. Four or five call offs max, there's no need for more. To relatively big chunks, divide the food into four pieces. So they're big chunks of food, and at this point I let the bird see the food you make your whistling sound or whatever noise you're going to use as well as a hand signal to call the bird in. The bird's coming, it's nervous at this stage, it still doesn't trust you fully. Don't call it for a little speck, 20 or 30 times. We're not trying to get the bird fit at this stage, we're just trying to instill that habit and routine of flying back to the falconer. Four or five call-offs, all going to plan, is worth more than 20 call-offs and then ending on a bad note when the bird won't come or veers off the fist and is pulled down gently by the line. You want to instill confidence, not the opposite, not take away confidence. Reasonable chunks of food, not many call-offs. Don't worry about distance. To start with, you're going to be starting ho hopping the bird a, a foot or a leash length and eventually a bit further than that. You don't need to go very far. You don't, as much as you don't need to do 20 or 30 call-offs before your bird's ready to fly free, you don't need great distance. You don't need 50 metres, 100 metres. 50 yards, 100 yards, all similar. You don't need that before the clearance is abandoned. For goodness sakes, it's going to end up snagging somewhere and just keep knocking up those confidence. 20 yards, 25 yards, that's plenty. Four or five times, maybe half a dozen times. 20, 20 25 yards. If that bird comes when you raise your glove and whistle, that bird is pretty much there, ready to go. But of course, one thing for sure, if you're using one training field only at this stage and you don't try it anywhere else, you might take that bird to another completely different field and that bird that five times back to back instant response won't budge. So before you get rid of the creants, make sure the bird still has the same sort of response somewhere strange. Give it five or 10 minutes if need be, but give it a few minutes to look around. But then if it freezes and it won't work there, You've not been doing your homework because you've just done that constantly one field thing or the one same place in a field thing. 
you've got to work around different strange places just to make sure the bird's response is spot on. Half a dozen times, 20 or 30 yards, let's push it further. <laughs> if the bird comes when you whistle it, get rid of the creants and get your telemetry on. Not get rid of your creants and buy telemetry when your bird's gone. That telemetry, by the time your bird is off the creants, you've already got the telemetry, you've already used the telemetry and practiced it time and time again. And if it comes with it, you've read the instructions because it's not rocket science. If you actually read about telemetry, there's more to it than you first think in so much as it gives you way more advantage of finding your bird than just the basic idea that some people think it does. Read about telemetry, find out how it works. But that's all for another video. Not easy one-handed, but you're folding up. You know you're not, you're rolling up. You're winding up. Your creant line, the same as a lure line. Let's see if I can show you. Turn the handle occasionally so the line doesn't build up on one side of the handle. Hopefully I'm doing this slowly enough. I'm running it under my foot. Don't do that. I'm just trying to do something one-handed here. And you wind it up like this. And then you unwind it like this. You don't get kinks and tangles in your line. So when you read the old books, I hope some of you watching this actually have read some Falconry books and it's not just YouTube and Facebook you're learning from. It won't get you all the way, believe you me. Read the books. Read the books that people have took a long time to write and paid a lot of money to publish, not just your Facebook claptrap. When you read those books, some books will say, always tie your creance line to the bird's swivel. Because leather jesses, they say, could be cut with the creance line and split and the bird will go free before it's ready and you might lose it. Others will say, never tie the, never tie the creants to the swivel. The swivel could snap and then the bird's free with its legs still shackled together, sure to be hung upside down eventually in a tree. Neither matters because A, you're using good quality jesses and even, I don't know, more importantly, maybe, you're using a good quality swivel that can't snap. And the reason the jesses won't split and the swivel won't snap is because you're going to use the creants properly. You're not going to spike it in the ground, stand on it or weigh it down with a rock because then when the bird does spook, which it may well do during your training, it's going to come to an abrupt stop at the end of the creance line, which regardless of it snapping the swivel or the splitting the jesses, that bird is going to be whatever speed it's got to in 20 or 30 yards, coming to an absolute abrupt stop on its maybe 10 week old bones, 16 week old bones, nowhere near fully calcified. That is not what the creance is there to do. It's not a full stop. The creance handle with the line still wound on of some of the line, obviously, it's going to go in your pocket, in your falconry vest. When that bird does veer off, you're going to be ready for it. You're going to expect that sooner or later it might veer off. And you're going to not only be flying it way away from anywhere it can then reach like a tree or a barbed wire fence, you're going to just move forward gently and bring that bird down gently. It's not hard to do. It's not rocket science. You're just feathering the line so the bird comes down gently. And you can do that because the creance line's in your pocket. Do not ever, ever weigh that creance line down or spike it into the ground. Absolute stupidity. You're bringing the bird down gently so it doesn't matter if your swivel is made of matchsticks. You're not going to break them because you're not coming to a full stop sudden ping on the line and the bird's legs are you so if you think about it either way is fine so this is pandora she's a trained bird a year old and i've never i don't think i've even picked this bird up she's flown by our brilliant staff here at icarus falconry and she's an experienced day bird and have a look at this so you've tied your creance line on to the bird's jesses all the swivel and you've used a couple of falconer's knots to do that. You haven't used some dog clip or something that's just gonna risk the life of your bird when it parts company and just falls to pieces or comes unclipped. This bird is free lofted. She isn't a tethered bird, so she just has permanent flying jesses on with tiny, tiny holes there. Should we need to tether for any reason or use a creance for any reason? 
So slightly different to what you're gonna have, but after me fiddling around to get a clearance line through those microscopic holes, we're ready to go. Of course, those of you that aren't just aspiring to be, are oh, just gonna fly a Harrisaur, that are actually aspiring to be falconers and wanna learn properly all about falconry, you're the guys that have already done your homework and you've read a lot of stuff on the internet and in books and you have, would have learned why the hood is the most marvellous piece of welfare equipment for your bird, whether it's a Harris Hawk, a Red Tail, or a Peregrine Falcon, or a Golden Eagle. And you will have employed the hood at this stage. So all of you guys that are really aspiring to be falconers proper, you will have had no problem at all, even with your very, very new, freshly sort of arrived bird, because tying on this creance and everything would have been completely stress-free for you and the bird, totally. The bird would have kept still on the glove because of course it's hooded one of a billion reasons to hood your bird when there's only really one reason not to hood your bird and that is you've made such a cock up of it you're now breaking down your relationship which can actually be completely undone given time and patience and a bit of know-how so you know me the hood massive welfare tool for your bird a brilliant bit of kit for falconry you would not use a swivel um, I don't know why you wouldn't know how to use a hood in falconry if that's what you really want to be passionate about but here we are we're ready to go Let's go and get into the training field. Okay, so I said to you guys, if you're only using one training field, you need to make sure that bird will respond well in a completely strange place. If you use one training field, use different areas of the field if you can. They give a different aspect for your bird. Now, really importantly, really importantly, I think in falconry, if you're practicing proper falconry and you're gonna fly that bird and hunt with that bird, you're a falconer, try and have a, tra try and have a training field that is pretty much devoid of game, that is your training field. Don't do your training where you also do your hunting. You're confusing the bird, and that bird that you want to be just going through and learning and going through the motions with you, maybe we're talking training such as even fitness training or even lure work if that's what you're going to do. Have a training field for that. So when the bird is out in the hunting field, the hood comes off or it comes out your van, your car, whatever, the travel box, and it knows where it is and it knows what it's about to do. When it sees the training field, it will quickly learn to pay attention to you, not be constantly scanning for game because it will know it's there to do training or fitness work. Really important. If you can have a designated training field for your fitness work and that kind of thing, highly recommend it. If you, if you try and combine the two out in the hunting field to a degree, you're, you're kind of selling yourself short on what you're trying to achieve a little bit really. fences and rails all the way around it. Now, often said in many a book, um, really, really true. This fence here, where are we? Let's say that fence there. What a perfect place to train your young bird from. Off of the fence, let him or her jump onto the fence and call her back in, just shouting because it's windy. Massive mistake, massive mistake. That bird that's nervous, that young bird can end up Walking, walking backwards and forwards along that top rail, trying to pluck up courage and not getting anywhere fast. Biggest mistake, when that bird's fully trained and ready to go hunting, or when you've called it a multi-million times from a fence rail like this, when you go in the hunting field, every time that bird sees a fence like that, it's gonna fly across the field to get to it because it knows if it touches that base and comes back, you're gonna give it a reward because that's what you've trained it to do. Fly to the fence, come back and get a reward. It will be a vice and a habit that will drive you insane if you're not careful. So either make yourself or get your local blacksmith to make you up a designated tea perch. Put a bit of AstroTurf on it. It doesn't see that everywhere else. And no, it won't fly on the ground when it sees grass. Designated tea perch that you can carry to a training field. That's what it does this kind of training from or find something in your field that it won't see anywhere else. In my old field, there used to be an old sort of abandoned metal bench years ago with a lovely smooth rounded top. It was a bit wide because the bird could hurry, scurry back and forth a bit if it was nervous, but it would never ever see a bench anything like that in that design or anything anywhere else. So it made a great training perch I didn't have to carry. Do not train your bird from the top rail of a fence. Make yourself a perch that it knows is the training perch. I may have to overlay this because it's so windy. Couple of things, 
don't do your early stage training on a windy day. Let it drop a bit. It will make all your lives easier. And if you are experienced training or any, flying anything with a young bird, call it into the wind. It can't control itself well crosswind. It can't control itself very well downwind at all. You're doing all your call-offs into the wind, even if you carry it back to the training perch and call it back again. Now, something I can do is unwind my clearance line with a bird sitting on there, not on my hand. Makes life easier because that bird's hooded. But never leave a bird hooded unattached to something. Hooded birds can and do fly away. But that's not going to end well. Also, of course, now we're getting ready. The clearance line <laughs> in my pocket. If the bird bolts past me, I can run, jog gently along just for a few paces and bring that bird down gently. Have a look around. Wish this wind would do one while I'm trying to do this. Have a look around. I've got trees. Whoa, we're going to get a bit gizzy giddy now. I've got trees all the way around me. Make sure that Koreans line cannot reach any single tree. Never do Koreans line training in your normal sized garden. The bird will fly over the fence and you'll look like a very cruel, unkind person. You're not going to do full career any good by looking like a cruel, unkind person when you're working with a bird of prey. So allow a bit of room for runoff because you're going to feather that line down. Worst of all, sometimes if you can't get permission to mow, try and find. It's not too bad. Day. None of the grass can grow. We're in a drought year. All these little stems of grass that stick up, the seed heads, they're designed by nature to snag on a creance line. If your bird gets snagged, it's going to demoralise it. You're calling it, it gets pulled down to the ground. That's why creance lines are vile things and you need to get rid of them as soon as you can. You want everything with your training of your bird to be utterly positive. You don't want negative stuff happening if you can help it. I've chosen this girl, Pandora, because I've never flown her. She's a flown trained bird for a year. She's probably going to be nervous and maybe that'll give us a chance to sort of talk you through some things, especially when I'm trying to, going to try and do this holding a camera in one hand, which might freak her out. And always do your training away from horses. They're designing life is to roll you flat. Anyway, I'm terrified of them and that's what I think. So we're going to pick her back up on the glove. We're going to unhood her. Look, how, look at the distance. It probably looks longer on the camera. It's about 15 feet. Uh, if you're young and you don't understand feet and you want to do everything in metres, that's fine. Google convert. We're going to unhood her and see what she does. Hold that space. So when you're using a creance line, if nothing else, if nothing else, run that through your little finger rather than just in your pocket. You've got much more control of that line. And of course, if you're using a T-perch, that the jesses can hook over the end. So make sure they don't before you call the bird, or again, you're going to call a bird that can't get anywhere. To start with, to start with, you're going to ask that bird to come to a little bit of food with your elbow, because I don't think she'll come, your bird, even a foot like this. There's no food here at the moment. I don't think she'll come. She'll be nervous. First time ever. The biggest thing in Fulcrum is getting that bird to just step onto the glove. So offer a little tip bit close up like this. Flip it now, darling. And then just put your elbow on the perch and let that bird step onto your glove to get the food where my fingers are wiggling. Literally, let it step across. And when you start creance line training the following day, always go back a step and give them an easy one to whet their appetite. Look at that, bless her. She's just doing that out of habit. And of course, we don't show our birds the food reward once they're trained, but we do during Korean line work. So we're going to show her the food this time. Zara, I can't do any hand signals. As soon as that bird's took that food, I can't show you this. Just get control of the jesses. Any hold how you like, that's fine. Get control of that bird's jesses because that nervous bird has most definitely got the aptitude to be now right near your face and you're looking at your bird and to jump straight up at your face out of nerve, push you in the face and fly away. If that goes in your eye, that's not nice. Control the jesses or the birds eating its food until you're ready again. You don't want the bird to fly anywhere at this stage because you're going to carry it back. So again, a bit of food on show. Of course, she's a trained bird. She's coming instantly. And once your bird's coming instantly, it's ready to go free. It doesn't have to be a big distance. And You've worked a little bit further now with your clearance training. Your bird eagerly looks forward to going back to the tea perch because she knows, touching base, she can come back 
and get a bit more food. Once that bird's come in relatively instantly, stop showing it the food. It doesn't need to see food to be recalled. So no food in the glove this time. But of course, to start with, you are showing food. You're just trying to get that bird's confidence up. But out in the field, if you show bird, the bird food every time and you want to do lots and lots of call-offs, that bird will not come to you unless it can see the food in the glove. They're not stupid. And of course, once you're out with a Harris Hawk following on, you're not rewarding it every time it comes to you as you walk along a tree line. Just some of the time. It knows it's worth gliding to the glove just on the off chance. But for to start with, of course, very important. Show them that food. Get that confidence up. So no food in the glove now. She doesn't know that. She's coming off chance. This bird's already trained. She won't resent you for it at all if that's the thing to do. I've got this bird. You can see this bird's body language. She's focused on me intently and she's just waiting for that glove to go up. This bird does not need to be on a creance any longer and neither does yours at this stage. Look at her, ready to go. Glove up. If you do bring your bird down or it gets snagged on a bit of grass or something, try not to let that happen. If the bird knows what it's doing and it recognises the perch, it'll probably fly back up to the perch. If it doesn't, just gently make into the bird step it onto the glove and pop it back on the perch. Don't leave it floundering if it doesn't know what it's doing. It's probably going to just look around and fly off to another tree and come down again. And you're just making a, a bad thing worse, basically. So be proactive. Keep it simple. The bird does not know what you want it to do or what it's meant to do. You're showing it gently. She'll do this all day long because, of course, she knows what she's doing. She's expecting there could be some food there eventually. And that's the point, if you do let the bird fly back to the tea perch, you're not letting that creance hook over the back to bring the bird down again. One thing I can't show you with this video is the hand signals we use. We do obviously put the glove out, so if the bird's unsure, it can fly on by. So this is what we're gonna do. The glove's right out here. If she's nervous, she can fly on by. Be aware, that nervous bird that flies on by, especially goshawks, have a really good tendency to smack you in the face as they go by. The nerves will lead to a grab. We've got secure. I don't know this bird. She doesn't know me. I'm talking to the camera. She can jump up and grab me in the face. They all have this potential. Don't underestimate your bird. It's not a fluffy pet. I hope you've enjoyed this short video. As always with me, you got a lot of waffle. I hope the idea's got across, especially if it's your first bird or you didn't do a very good job. Uh, last year and you've got your bird through the malt and now you're thinking about getting her going again and doing a bit of retraining. But of course, if you can do things right the first time around, what you're looking for, is, and that horse is getting there, is as little vices as possible, even if it's your first bird. Do your research up front. Less vices, less bad habits, because bad habits with birds of prey, you tend to have to work around very hard to straighten them back out again. She's scanning around, having a look at the countryside. Check out my other playlist, my Fulkery playlist. There's lots of tips and things on there already that hopefully will help some of you guys out. From me and Pandora, see you in the next video.